and welcome to Knit Tea Live. The fact that I'm having a Knit Tea Live today means, yes, I did not get my upload yet done. <laughs> I promise I will have uploads soon, I hope. Uh, but welcome if you are joining me live. Thank you so much for being here today. Please make sure to say hi in the live chat. Uh, and hello, Mr. Me. Of course, of course, I can rely on Mr. Me. I, I feel like Mr. Me is becoming my co-host, frankly. <laughs> but thank you so much for being here today. Um, and if you're watching on the replay, you can still join the conversation. I still respond to comments. Just, you know, comment down below if you're watching on the replay. And if you are watching on the replay and you wanna skip around to any part of the conversation, I will have timestamps in the description box after the replay is over. So um, I appreciate everybody who takes time out of their day to spend a little time with me, Carrie Craft Geek. Um, so yes, ooh, okay, oh, sorry. I have to get through all my little plugs, you know? So please make sure to give this video a thumbs up while it's fresh in your mind. And also if you're, oh, excuse me, excuse me. I'm gonna take a sip of coffee from my Contigo mug, which I love. Hashtag not sponsored, but if you do want one, you could always use my Amazon link down in the description box because I am an Amazon affiliate. <laughs> and using my affiliate links does help support my channel. Um, and uh, yeah, so wow, that was an unplanned plug, but I'm glad I fit that in. Anyway, but also I have to plug the fact that yes, Super Chats are on. What is Super Chat? It's just kind of a live tipping system on YouTube. If you, you know, give me a Super Chat, your comment gets highlighted um, and I'm internally grateful. And any tips I receive, whether it's during the live stream with Super Chat or it's, uh, later through my buy me a coffee link also in the description box all those tips get reinvested back into my channel and my website that so i can keep improving and growing this community so yes is that all my plugs yes all my plugs are done whoop whoop <sighs> you know it's just it's part of being the youtube life part of the youtube life is you got to put in the plugs <laughs> It's not my favorite thing, but you got to do it. You have to do it. Uh, oh, also, uh, during the replay, if there's any technical glitch, my audio is not working, anything like that, please let me know because I have no way of knowing unless you comment to me. Um, just like to throw that out as well. Okay. Oh, sorry. I have notes down below, which is why I keep looking down, but um, it's on a separate computer. So I have to remind myself to go to a different mouse to scroll. Um so today, what are we talking about today? We have a jam-packed, or at least I think I have a jam-packed live stream planned for today. And um, a lot of things to cover. We might lo run longer than an hour. This is long form content and I am will just go until I can't go anymore. But I think it's gonna probably be about an hour 15, maybe an hour 20 live stream today. So if you're just trying to plan out your day, that's what I think it's going to turn out to be, roundsabouts. Anyway, so, but topics for today. We are going to talk about grafting. Why, uh, specifically, we're going to talk about the Kitchener stitch, which is a form of grafting, why it's called the Kitchener stitch, and why maybe it's time that we stop calling it that, because there's some interesting history behind the name Kitchener. And so we're gonna dive into that today. Um, we are also, wrong computer, Carrie, wrong computer. There we go. Get Pull it together, score. Uh, we also, I'm gonna tell you about an exciting sale that is going on with Nitpicks. Yes, yes, I am a Nitpicks affiliate as well. Uh, but I have been a Nitpicks fan for 20 years. <laughs> I mean, maybe not, well, pretty close to 20 years I've been shopping at Nitpicks. Me and Nitpicks have a long history together. Long before YouTube, I was ordering yarn from Nitpicks and they've got a big summer sale going on. So uh, it actually starts, there are some parts of the sale that have started already, but 
we're going to go into all the details of the sale and how it works. And I'm going to show you a few things, some exciting things, I think, on sale at Nitpicks that if it isn't on your wish list, either it's because you already have it or it should be on your wish list. Okay. And this might be a chance to score something good for yourself. Um, and then we're going to do Pattern Spotlight. Uh, with Pattern Spotlight, I will share with you my May Pattern of the Month. I finally got my blog post up that uh, reviews all the new pattern releases that were featured on Fiber Happenings in the month of May. And I pick my favorite pattern from that. So that blog post is up. So I will share it with you today during the live stream, as well as a couple of new pattern releases and kind of part of all this sales and and pattern spotlight i will be answering a question from i hope a subscriber asking and this was a really great question how do you store your works in progress so if you have an answer to that question well, during the live stream feel free to share with everybody how you store your uh projects but i'm going to have an answer and some solutions during pattern spotlight so that is everything yes um and also again i am trying to be more organized with my live stream a little less squirrel about it which i have a tendency to do and so I'm going to try to go through topic, then come back and go through comments, read through comments, answer questions, that sort of thing. Um, so if you are watching live, please, please, please feel free to comment, ask questions, answer questions, and be part of the conversation. One of the really fun things about live stream is that it is interactive. That's one of the things I love most about it. Um, so I already said hi to Mr. Me. Hello, Kathleen Fry. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, bears, crochet critters. So glad that you've had time to come join us for these part of the live stream today. If you do not know, I'm here to tell you now that bear crochets critters, I'm sorry, I'm not saying that right. Bears crochet critters now has her own YouTube channel. Check it out. All right. Check it out. Subscribe. Hit the notification bell for her. And if you haven't done that for me already, you know, you know the drill. You know the drill. <laughs> okay. So let's get into. Uh, yes, this is the computer I need. Make sure I have the right thing up as we get into this. Hello, Whitney! Yay! You're here today! Yay! So glad you can make it. I gotta say, Whitney Bear have been, like, I think they were here for my first live stream. Maybe. I think they were here for my first live stream. Like, they have, like, they have been, like, one of my early subscribers, big supporters. I so appreciate you. And I, I'm just always so glad when you're here. I, I enjoy our parasocial relationship with one another. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's get into the main topic for today, which is grafting, AKA the Kitchener stitch, why it's called that and why it might be time to stop calling it the Kitchener stitch. How did this topic even come up? Well, earlier this week, I'm gonna add this to the here, Kate Atherley tweeted this out uh, somebody tweeted about the Kitchener stitch is named after a British general from the late 1800s, early 1900s. He was a big part of the World War I recruitment effort. Somebody tweeted something out about him. And Kate Atherley, you know, knitting teacher extraordinaire, tech editor extraordinaire, uh, tweeted out why I prefer to the knit. Bleh, sorry, let me try that again. I'm very excitable this morning, which means I'm mumbling and stumbling over my words. I apologize. Stop. Slow down. Why I prefer to refer to the knitting technique as grafting. Lord Kitchener was a nasty piece of work. What? Had you heard about this? I did not know. I am like my, I have been to England several times in my life. I studied in London, actually, my senior year of college. And uh, I love England. I love England. Uh, this is a story for another time. But I actually when I went to study in London for a semester, I arrived the, the weekend that Princess Diana died. 
So I was, I was there for all of that. That's a story for another time. Um, but anyway, I, but so I love England, but I'm also not like an, an expert on British history by any stretch of the imagination. So I was like, wow. So I, you know, I decided I want to Google this and I spent 20 minutes Googling and I'm going to share with you why Kate Atherley wrote this and what I discovered. And we can discuss maybe what we should start alternative names for what I'm not, right now going to refer to as the grafting technique, formerly known as the Kitchener stitch. That's what I'm going with for right now. It's a mouthful, but I think we all know I can talk quickly. So, mm, notes. So who was Kitchener? Let's start with that. And I wanna make sure that I get my right thing up. Okay, so this is how many people in England are most familiar with Lord Kitchener. Lord, oh gosh, I did write down his name. Lord Horatio Herbert Kitchener, first Earl Kitchener of Khartoum. Uh, this was a famous recruiting poster in uh, England at the beginning of World War I. This was Lord Kitchener recruiting people into the military to fight the Germans. Uh, in the US, you know, we have Uncle Sam, the army wants you. I think that's what the tag is. Well, in the UK, they had Lord Kitchener and this poster. And what Kitchener, the, he was really famous for two things, right? The first thing he was famous for was this poster. And World War I, he was the Secretary of State for War. And he predicted a long war between England and Germany. I'm sorry, that was, I wanted this one. There we go. He predicted a long war between uh, Germany and the UK and the Allied forces in World War One, and he did a big recruitment campaign to like expand the military. Um, and he also associated himself with the Red Cross. And at this time with the Red Cross, they were um, recruiting women in the UK, in Canada, and in the US to knit what they called comfort items for soldiers, namely scarves, mittens, and socks. All right, let me get to my next little slide here. Uh, oh, this is the entry that explains some of this from, um, just so you, here we go. This is the entry from the National Portrait Gallery from the UK, their website about, and there's a link to this entry down in the description box, but they talk about the war effort and, um, <laughs> I'm going to read from this. He rapidly enlisted and trained vast numbers of volunteers for a succession of entirely new Kitchener armies. Kitchener also associated himself with a Red Cross plan to exhort British, American, and Canadian women to knit various comforts for the men in the trenches, including mittens, scarves, and socks. He is said to have contributed his own sock design, which included a squarish, grafted, spelled G-R-A-W-F-T-E-D, toe. The toe featured a seamless grafting stitch that made socks more comfortable for troops to wear and which became known as the Kitchener stitch. Um, so that is how, somewhat how, the Kitchener stitch got its name. However, whether uh, Lord Her Herbert Horatio Kitchener actually designed this sock and submitted it is kind of up for debate. I found a blog post um, from In The Round, link to it in the description box, and they cite, or read this. Oh, let me expand this so you can see it better. This is, I'm quoting from In The Round, the blog. Indeed, knitting historian Richard Rutt claims that this grafting technique, known as Kitchener stitch, was actually invented, I, sorry, I added actually, was invented around 1880. Later, in 1918, Vogue magazine published a sock pattern with a graft in tow and called it 
the Kitchener Sock, crediting Lord Kitchener for being a war effort champion, but Vogue did not claim he was the pattern designer. So it's a matter of debate whether uh, Kitchener actually designed and submitted this sock or if this sock and this grafting technique was just named in his honor. But regardless, it happened, right? And <laughs> I have to sit here and laugh for a moment when people are like, but knitting shouldn't be involved in politics. But as we can see here, knitting is often involved in politics because war is political. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to pause here because this is a good time to bring up this comment from Mr. Me. Anyone who lived over 100 years ago was awful. Well, I think you can make that claim past and presently. But here is why Lord Kitchener was particularly awful. This is a really, this comment's a really good segue into the second thing that Kitchener is famous for. And it is a nasty piece of business, uh, to quote Kate Atherley. Um, Hello, Samantha Hanhart. Thank you so much for being here today. You come just in time to find out why it might be time to rename the Kitchener Stitch. Um, so, we're going to go to the next thing. <sighs> Sorry, I got to take a breath. I realized I don't think I've breathed in the last couple of minutes. Uh, okay, get back to my notes, refocus. So, the second thing... Here we go. Uh, the second thing Kitchener is famous for is mass death. I know that sounds harsh. I know that sounds harsh, but it's true. Now, if you live in the UK or Commonwealth country, you might be more familiar with the history of the British Empire and the Boer Wars. I think here in the United States, it's something we're a little sketchy on. Uh, if you don't know, in the late 1800s, um, South Africa, that's a whole history in and of itself. But uh, there were two independent republics that now make up South Africa. One was, uh, I have it here in my notes, the South Africa Republic, and the other was the Orange Free State. Uh, and the people there were the Boers, who were uh, descendants of Dutch colonial colonialists and settlers in this area of Africa. Uh, there were also other non uh, Dutch descended settlers in the area. And of course, people, you know, Native Africans <laughs> to, you know, these African nations. And the British basically try to gain control of this area because it does have or did have large deposits of gold and gold mining operations. And there was the Second Boer War. And Let's see, do, 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 caught that. Kitchener, he basically took over, Kitchener took over the campaign in the Boer War for the British military in, if I'm remembering correctly, I wrote it down, but I'm not seeing the number, in 1901. And when he did, um, he pursued something called a scorched earth strategy, which was basically to burn down the farms of Boer, the Boers people and various Africans who had farms in these regions. He burned the farms down and then he took the women and children and he put them in concentration camps. Yes. And these were not, not nice places to be from all reporting that I found. Uh, it was unhygienic. There was actually an international outcry about the conditions in these internment camps that women and children were being forced to live in. And uh, over 20,000 women and children died in these internment camps. Uh, and also a large number of African people died as well, but we don't have exact numbers because those weren't recorded because, you know, they were black people and these were white people, colonialist. And that is what tends to happen in history. But it tend, uh, it's estimated between twelve to 13,000 people, African people died as well in these, in these internment camps. I mean, if this had happened in today's day and age, this would be considered a war crime. 
this happened in the early 1900s and it was just considered a strategy. Um, so yeah, that is the second reason that Lord Kitchener is famous. <laughs> and when you find out that bit of history, it does, it makes me go, ew, ew, <laughs> I think. So, uh, you know, I think for me personally, for me personally, the combination of mass death and kind of the questionable history of whether of Kitchener not even inventing this technique, it was somebody else, somebody forgotten in history, probably a woman. Yeah, I think it's probably time that we started calling the grafting technique currently known as Kitchener Stitch as something else. Now, Kate Atherley recommended calling it just grafting because that's what it is. I would love to hear from you if you have any thoughts on what it can be called because personally, I'm not a fan of just calling it grafting because this stitch technique, this grafting technique, formerly known as Lord Kitchener, uh, I'm sorry, this grafting technique, formerly known as the Kitchener stitch. Um, it is one type of, it's one method, it's one technique, but there are other grafting techniques, which I've actually learned this week, uh, that get you the same result as this stitch does that are also grafts. So I feel like, mm, I feel like grafting is a broad category of, 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 grafting techniques. It's a broad category and this particular stitch is one. And so I think just calling it grafting is A, misleading and B, not specific enough. Because what the Kitchener stitch does, I'm sorry, what the technique formerly known as the Kitchener stitch does is it uses a needle to sew in a line of knitted stitches. Uh, it's really good for stockinette fabrics because it creates a seamless join between two separate fabrics, and it's why it's often utilized for soft toes if you're knitting from the cuff down. Um, it's relatively easy to do. People, though, struggle with remembering how to do it. <laughs> As it is a specific set of directions to create the effect that it does. The thing about this uh, grafting technique, formerly known as the Kitchener stitch, yes, I'm going to beat this into the ground. Uh, the drawback of it is it's really best for a stockinette stitch. If you are wanting to do a graft that is involving, like, say, fabrics with ribbing, and you just follow the directions for this grafting technique, you're not gonna get that same seamless result, you know, because you're inserting just a line of knit stitches and those pearl bumps. So there is a way to adapt the idea behind Kitchener Stitch to make it match patterns of fabrics that you're joining together with the graft, but it's you're now getting into something that's really not Kitchener Stitch. So personally, my suggestion was to call it stockinette graft. Because I think that's gets at most accurately what the purpose of this stitch pattern is. Uh, Kate Atherley agreed with me too. <laughs> I'm so excited. Uh, somebody mentioned though that it, the term stockinette is more commonly used in the US and in the UK it's more commonly said as stocking stitch. You call it stocking stitch graft as well. I mean, it would not be the first time that the U.S. and the U.K. had different terminology for the same thing. The famous phrase, the U.S. and the U.K., two countries joined. <laughs> no, two, two languages separated. No, two countries separated by a common language. <laughs> Something like that. Um, Bear, she wrote... Stock and graft stitch could be a name. I, yeah, stock and graft stitch could be the name. I think that would work well. I think that is pretty close to what it is doing. Um, so that's what I tend to lean towards. But yeah, I just thought that was a really kind of very interesting piece of history and knitting history. I also, if I'm going to get on my feminist, um, I'm closing some tabs right now. If I was going to get on my some of my feminist so Fox, I'd also just say that I think there's something about naming a knitting technique 
after a dude who didn't invent it <laughs> and forgetting who I know look it might have been a man men knit men in the 1800s late 1800s knitted but there's also a good chance that it was a woman who invented it, and their name is lost to history as best as I can tell so you know make that what you will make of that symbolism what you want <laughs> So yeah, um, let's see. I just want to make sure I hit my talking points person. Oh, I'm going to burp. I'm sorry. Oh, just a little one. Yay. Okay. One thing though, I did want to, um, let's see, Mr. Me. I probably won't use a different name. I mean, I grew up on Kitchener Street. I went to Kitchener School and I dated someone from the town Kitchener. And I had no idea who he was. <laughs> uh, it's not benefiting him. Well, I mean, that's fair. I mean, that's a fair point. And that's, uh, a, I'm not going to argue that point of view. And I understand that point of view for sure. You know, um, I, I think this is one of those areas, you know, different people are going to look at this at different, different ways. I think part of the reason I, the, the history of Lord, uh, Herbert, Herbert Horatio Kitchener aside, I've always sort of graded personally under the fact that so many people have taken this stitch pattern and made it synonymous with grafting as if this is all what grafting is, is this one thing. I mean, to the point where we have notions and project bags emblazoned with directions for this technique because we're it almost seems as though the impression is left that this is the only way to craft and that's why i don't want to just call it grafting <laughs> and uh a lot of times i won't refer to it because i want people to think about grafting as being something bigger than this one technique um that's my own little like you know pet peeve, if you will. But speaking of, there are other grafting techniques as well. There's one that I was just learning this week and I shot the video for it yesterday. It's called the Finchley and I have not looked into the history of why that is called the Finchley graft. It's called the Finchley graft. Um, and it gets the same result, you know, as the, uh, what I'm going to refer to as the stockinette graft. It gets the same result, but does it, approaches it in a different way, from a different side even. So uh, I'm looking forward to showing that video. Uh, it won't take as long to edit as this movie video is taking me to edit. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's everything that I had to share about that little bit of interesting history of knitting and grafting technique. And I have to say, personally, I'm I'm always kind of fascinated about how things get named the way they do and how names become attached to various techniques. I could do a video, I could do another Knit Tea Live where we talk about the history of the um, strong heel versus, oh crumb, I'm blanking on it. Oh, it's a heel that people love and it's, it's the same concept as the strong heel. Um, oh, I'm blanking. If anybody remembers the name of the heel technique, that's usually described with a toe up where you do increases to create the gusset and then you decrease it away on the heel turn. It's not the strong heel. It's another type of heel. Um, I cannot remember what it's called. Shoot. It's just Flegel. Thank you, Catherine. Kathleen Fry. Yes. The Flegel heel. The Flegel heel versus the strong heel. It's actually something that came up when I did my video on the strong heel because somebody asked me what the difference between it and the Flegel heel was. So I started looking into kind of the publishing history of these techniques. So um, that's something else we could talk about on another day. Because I, I just think it's interesting. I think the history of knitting and how things developed and who gets credited for what is really fascinating. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, Samantha H came up with a name for the graph. Uh, K off, P on, P off, K on is what came to my mind, but that is a bit of a mouthful. Yeah, 
let's see, could we maybe just shorten it to the cop, pock, cop, cop, pock, cop, pock, craft. <laughs> cop, pock. That's not easy to say either. <laughs> but it, I like it because it does put the directions right in the name. Um, Let's see, Bear, I need the setup directions for grafting technique you did a while back. I know I will have to review them that again the next time I need. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Bear is referencing a video I did a while ago. I call it like a knitter in the wild. And I talked through my thought process while I did a graft. And it turned out to be because um, I my famous dishcloth pattern, <laughs> not my famous pattern, it's not my famous pattern, but it is a, well, it's a dishcloth pattern. It's a medallion and I use a graft to finish it off. And so I did a video where I showed how I did that graft and how it starts. Cause that's what I always struggle with, with this grafting technique is remembering how to start it. Um, but I kind of broke down my thought process on how I approach grafting when I use this sort of sewn technique that the Kitchener stitch does. I don't, I hope that was clear. I'm not sure what I just said was clear. Um, <laughs> yes, Mr. Me. It sounds very Klingon kapok. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Maybe we call it the Klingon, <laughs> the Klingon graft. How about that? We just because wow, that is really that's roundabout. That's a roundabout way to getting a name. But yes, kapok. We're going to kapok the toe. <laughs> oh, thank you, Bear. Bear was just saying that my video on grafting it made so much sense to me and helped a lot. Thank you so much. And by the way, with that video, not only did I demonstrate my thought process of when I'm grafting. Because I don't remember, I never really memorized the directions. Instead, I kind of just memorized my thought process on how to do this sort of graft, um, the kapok graft. As I now really want to, <laughs> I now just want to call it the kapok graft. <laughs> um, but uh, this graft, I never really memorized the directions. I just remember a thought process on how to approach grafting and that's how I that's how I've always kind of kept it straight but I also have a blog post if you're not like somebody who likes to watch video tutorials you like something a little bit more written out I have I have a blog post that are like my rules for grafting so yeah kapok I just I, I feel like I'm gonna say kapok all day now kapok but where's the emphasis is it the first is it kapok or is it kapok or kopok? Kapok? I think we're going to just go with kapok because that's what I said first. And it, it keeps making me laugh. <laughs> All right. All righty. So we're about like 33 minutes in. If Unless anybody has any else. And, unless anyone has anything else they'd like to say about crafting or this little interesting tidbit of history or anything like that, I think we can move on. So the nitpick sale, the nitpick sale, it's not just nitpicks though. I, so again, I am a nitpicks affiliate. What does that mean? That means that if you click on one of my nitpick links and you make a purchase at nitpicks, I then get a small commission. That's what it means. It, I did not know this, but nitpicks also owns the website, uh, we crochet. So a lot of the a lot of the stuff is the same between the two websites, but there are differences. There are some different things that you find on We Crochet than you find on Nitpicks. Like We Crochet has those furl, which are so pretty, furl crochet hooks. Whereas I don't think the Nitpicks website sells them. Excuse me, but both websites are having a huge summer sale for the next four weeks. And the way it's going to work is throughout the sale, throughout the sale, you can save up to 40% on tools. Uh, it's like 10 to 40% you can save on tools, like project bags, Swifts, ball binder, like anything, almost anything that's a tool. Uh, it doesn't seem like all of their like needles and crochet hooks are on sale, but it seems like some of them are. So anyway, also throughout the sale, 
With any purchase, you get a free 2021 yarn guide. Uh, knit picks only, you get a, oh, j if you order just from the knit pick side, you also get, let me start that over again. If you order something through the knit picks website, you get a free ebook download of, with, sorry. The way this is written, I copied and pasted this from my email that I got from Nitpicks about all this. It doesn't make, it was written oddly, but basically with a $40 purchase and you use the promo code ebook2021, you can get a free ebook download from Nitpicks. And I think that's like patterns. And on We Crochet, with a $30 purchase on We Crochet, and you use the promo code under 100, you get um, a free ebook download from We Crochet. So I believe those are pattern books. But each week of the sale, so you wanna check back each week during this month long sale, they have a different special uh, and they go up on Monday. So tomorrow uh, their first week sale will be going on. And I will just say that if you are interested in trying your hand at home dyeing or you like to dye your own yarn i think you might be excited about the sale that will be happening during this summer sale extravaganza on nitpicks and we crochet but um i did think that we could just take a quick look at some things uh, let me just get, I got to get to the right thing, but we could take a quick look at some items that, uh, definitely, definitely caught my eye when I saw them. Um, some of these are things that I have, but I just know other people might have them on their wish list. So I want you to know that this could be a chance to get something that you've been wanting for a while at a really nice discounted price. So first one that we have is a yarn swift this is a wooden umbrella yarn swift um you know there's different yarn swifts that you can get i personally have i don't have this yarn swift i don't have this wooden yarn swift um but i have an umbrella style wooden yarn swift myself i love it it attaches right here on my bookcase you can't see it it's off camera but on the other end of it is my my is my Swift, um, and I love it. It's great. And if you've been wanting a yarn Swift, this is a really nice price, I will say. This could be a good opportunity to grab that for yourself uh, if you're interested in a yarn Swift. The other thing, if you already have a yarn Swift, and but you can't just set it up permanently as a ball winding station like I have over here. You can see my ball winder right here. Um, and also the ball winder, Nitpicks sells a ball winder, winder that's pretty much this, but in a different color. Uh, that's also on sale. But they have, sorry, see, I just did it. I went squirrel. But anyway, if you have a Swift, but you cannot always just have it set up all the time, something you might want to look at. I was, I wish I'd had this when I was living in my condo and I couldn't have a permanent ball winding station is a Swift case. I just think this is so, so cool. I think this is so cool. Um, this one is in rose gold. There are other colors and um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely something you can get on sale 10% off. And I used to keep my yarn swift in the original box that it came in and then put it in the closet. But I think this is like, I wish I'd had this. I wish I'd had this. Part of me goes, maybe I'll, mm, excuse me. Mm. <clears throat> excuse me. Part of me goes, I, I might get this just in case I have to break it down for some reason and travel with it. Um, I just, I think it's a really great idea having a yarn swift case like that. Wouldn't be long enough probably to be used as a yarn, as a yoga bag, but it kind of looks like a yoga bag, doesn't it? Um, something else. And actually I am, I do have this from Knit Picks, although not this color. I have an, an older model of it is but i think it's something that's really good for any knitter to have especially if you like to work with charts or you do a lot of color work and that is just a basic 
chart keeper. I love the color. There we go. The color of this one is in teal. Mine is black. I wish I had the teal. <laughs> but it's really basic um, tool to have in your arsenal. What's really nice, though, is it's magnetized. And so you can put your chart in it. The magnets hold it in place. And then you have this long bar right here. Um, I wish I could zoom in, but I can't, apparently. No, no, no zoom. But that long bar you can use and move it up the line to keep track of where you are on your chart. And it's really great to travel with. Um, you can prop it up into a little tent shape. So it props up on your table really nicely. Uh, I love my chart minder. If you don't have one, again, this is a good opportunity to get one at a nice price. Because, um, you know... And it's, you gotta love a sale. You gotta love a sale. The last thing I'm gonna point out, there's a lot of, like I said, a lot of tools on sale uh, during the summer sales. Sorry, I'm doing a sales pitch right now. It, but, but somebody did ask me on the community tab of the YouTube channel uh, what people use to store their works in progress. Now, I admit, oftentimes, my storage is just my couch. <laughs> but a really good thing to store your projects in is a project bag. And uh, you can get, sorry, um, you can get a project bags right now. These, they have, different ones on sale, but I wanted to point these out from Nitpicks. These are clear project bags from Nitpicks. Um, it's, I think sometimes it's really nice to be able to look into <laughs> through the bag and see what's in it as opposed to having to open it up. So if you like the idea of a clear project bag, you can get, again, this is on sale at Nitpicks and they have various sizes for different prices. And also, I just realized down at the bottom, they have a Notions bag that's clear. And mine, my this is my Notions bag right here. And it's not totally clear. It's semi-opaque. But I do love that I can A, see into it pretty well, but also when I open it, you know, because it's clear, a lot of light gets into it. So I never feel like, oh gosh, my bag is so dark. So having a clear notions bag, I am a fan of. It's really nice to have. So those were just a few things I wanted to point out from the nitpick sale. If you are interested in it, uh, if you like nitpicks, um, I wanted to let you know that it's there. And if you want to use one of my affiliate links, they're down in the description box, and that does help support the channel. And just like with my tips, any commissions I ever receive um, get reinvested back into the channel so that I can um, upgrade equipment, I can buy supplies, both for tutorial and for review, and, you know, just help improve the channel and communicating with all y'all and growing this community. So thank you so much when you do use my affiliate links. I so appreciate it. And as always, I never recommend a product I would not recommend to my very best friends, who is my sister. Anyway, uh, let's see. Bear said about, I believe this is about the Swift uh, case, that the strap looks handy too. Yes, it does. Um, the Swift case has a carrying handle and that, you know, especially if you're someone who likes to travel, with your stuff for like fairs or knitting conventions or anything like that, being able to just like throw it onto your shoulder is handy. Or let's say you have a friend, let's say you have a friend who's just new into knitting and crochet. They need to get some ball yarn wound. They're not ready to invest in a Swift and a ball winder, which is totally understandable. You can help a fellow knitter out and take your Swift with you to their house and, you know. So anyway, yes, I, and there's some pretty colors. I, I just grabbed the link for the rose gold one, but there's like a teal one. There was like, I saw four colors, four different colors for those um, Swift bags. I got very excited about that bag. Uh, speaking of bags and project bags, if you're not interested in clear plastic bags or you wanna support a small, business. 
Etsy is a great place to source your um, project bags. And I wanted to point out a particular store and someone I consider a friend of the channel, and that is uh, Germander Cottage Crafts on Etsy. She is known as Germander CC, and she sells all sorts of things on her site. She does these handmade aprons, but she makes project bags, and she always has new fun patterns coming out. I'm just clicking on this one right now. Sorry, you have, there we go. And this has these dice, oh, these are dice bags, I'm sorry. Although, you know what, dice bags, depending on the size of them, might be able to use them for um, small projects as well, but those are dice bags. But I know she sells project bags as well. And those are hand-painted, wow. I know she sells, because I've seen her <laughs> talking about them on Twitter. Where's one of her project bags? She sells all sorts of neat things. She sells these cards, um, eco-friendly cards. She sells yarn. She sells knitted projects. She sells patterns. Um, and she does some, where are they? I'm, I don't know why I can't believe I'm not finding them. Does she have it under, not patterns, notions? Sorry, I should be better prepared. Notions? Nope. That's, I know she does. I know she makes, I know she makes project bags. I've seen her talk about them on Twitter. Um, maybe she just doesn't have any at, at the moment. But I, now I'm feeling embarrassed. <laughs> that I can't find them. <laughs> um, so, yeah. But she has a lot of great, neat things. Buttons, notions. Oh, here's one. <sighs> Thank God. This is a project bag that she has. Um, this is more of the tote style, but it's so cute with the sheep on them. So yeah, but I wanted to give her a shout out. Uh, she has a lot of neat things. Definitely, definitely, I would recommend checking out her Etsy store at some point. Let's see, Whitney. What does Whitney have to say? I'm trying out sewing and I want to try to make projects bags. I'm hoping it works out. <laughs> LOO, totally a beginner in sewing. You know what? If you are a beginner at sewing, because a few years ago I was a beginner at sewing, I can tell you that making tote bags and project bags is a great first project to do. The first projects I did were bags, tote bags, and then I did a, um, you know, a little makeup bag, and that's how I learned how to do zippers. Uh, it's a great first project because it's it, they're really straightforward. And it, actually, I'll show you something too. Be right back. This is, uh, this is a thread catcher that I made and it has a pin cushion attached to it. And yeah, you can see all my, <laughs> all my thread. But this is a thread catcher and um, this is a pin cushion and it's weighted so when I put this down on a desk, or over the arm of a couch, it just stays put right there. And I love this. And I wasn't sewing for that long before I was able to do this. So I'm just here to tell you that things like this and a project bag is just a bigger version of this part is, is a good beginner sewing project, okay? So I wanna assure you, you can do it because it's, it's mostly straight lines. You're mostly knitting, you're mostly sewing straight lines. Whitney. That looks cool. It is. It is. It's very cool. And honestly, I even drew up the pattern myself. I totally, I mean, I saw other ones online and I had done one. I made another one. There's another one in my thing. I'll get it too. Why not? I'll show off. This is the first one I made. This one I did get a pattern for. Oops, focus. This is the other one I made. I got a pattern for it. And this holds all my magic clips. For when I'm sewing, you can, oops, I'll just grab them. This holds all my magic clips. So when I'm sewing, this bag and my thread catcher just sit right on the table next to me. And I can just grab what I need. Focus, focus. I'm moving around and my autofocus is going, oh my gosh. So yeah. And those were, like I said, some of the first things I ever made. Yes, let's encourage Whitney. You can do it. Get comfortable with your sewing machine. I never, I, 
I avoided learning how to sew for so long. And once I learned how to sew, I was like, why did I avoid this for so long? Why was I so scared? I was like, I'll never be able to sew a straight line. Turns out, <laughs> turns out sewing a straight line is not that difficult. It's really not if you have a good guide. And then I was like, I'll never be able to learn how to sew curves on a sewing machine. But with practice, I learned, oh, I see how you do this. Here's my tip about that for you, Whitney. This is my tip. This is what someone taught. Don't watch the needle when you're sewing. Watch the edge of the fabric. It's like driving. When you drive, you don't watch the steering wheel. You watch the lines on the road and your hands take care of everything else. Same thing with sewing. You don't watch the needle. You watch the edge of your fabric and just let, trust that your hands are gonna guide it the correct way. Remember, that's my tip for sewing. <laughs> Yeah, Whitney, the sewing machine always scared me, LOL, but I'm taking the leap. Yes. Oh, well, you know what? Let's be honest. A sewing machine is a piece of heavy equipment. It's a piece of heavy machinery. Um, but I even, oh God, I remember the first time my needle broke on the sewing machine. Oh, it will happen. It happens to everybody uh, if you sew long enough. And that, but it's, it's really nothing to fear. You have control over it. So, yeah. But speaking of Germander CC, Germander Cottage Crafts, uh, this segues nicely into, <laughs> and it was completely coincidental how this came out, by the way, but this segues nicely into my May pattern of the month because, let me get to here. Yes. My main, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not sticking the landing here. My May pattern of the month is... Germander Cottage Tideline Shawl. Um, this is the shawl here. Uh, you can find this pattern on her Etsy, in her Etsy store. Um, excuse me, I'm going to burp again. But yeah, this, I, I swear it's a coincidence. Yesterday I was doing the blog post for the May pattern releases and I um, I was like, you know what? I think this is my May pattern of the month because it's a straightforward, asymmetrical triangle shawl, but it's knit in garter stitch, but it has the stripes that make it interesting. And it's just a good, relaxing knit. And I think it's kind of a good, interestingly enough, a good summer knit because A, yes, this was designed with wool, but you could knit this very easily in a cotton or a linen. I think that would be a lovely substitution. And garter stitch is actually really good for those plant-based fibers that sometimes we lean towards in the summer months. And even though, okay, we're heading into these hot days, do you need a shawl? But here's my answer to that. A, you could have this done in time for fall. And at that point, don't we wanna bring our shawls back and our scarves? Yes. Yes, we do. But also, how many times the, the world is, we're kind of coming out of our 2020 cocoon a bit, you know? Maybe you're ready to venture inside of a movie theater. Sometimes having a shawl just in your bag. So if the air conditioning is turned up a little too high, you just throw your shawl on and get a little comfort. So I think that a shawl like this is actually you, you can wear this any time of year. So uh, that was my May pattern of the month. And I picked it yesterday. And then today I was getting my links ready for today's live stream. And the project bag question came up this morning. And I was like, oh, I know Germander Cottage Crafts sells project bags. <laughs> it's like the whole universe came together for me to highlight uh, her store today. So I went with it. So uh, that is the May pattern of the month. And there are two new pattern releases this month to show off. This month. There are two new pattern releases to show off this week. Let me just get to them. I want to make sure this is set up. That's there. All right. Uh, the first one is from Amy Snell. Uh, the Devious Knitter, and this is her 
proud to be sock. So this is the sock. It's very colorful. It's very appropriate for June, which is Pride Month here in the United States. Uh, it is obviously a rainbow striped sock, but it has a little bit of textured stitches in it to make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, this sock is knitted from the toe up and it features a afterthought heel. So, um, uh, sorry, I'm just laughing a little bit because one of the techniques that is used in this sock is the kapok graft or the uh, stockinette graft or the <laughs> the graft formerly known as Kitchener Stitch. Anyway, uh, but yes, so she has this sock out right now. The other new pattern release is one of, from, if you've been, oh, that's in the wrong place. Sorry, I just realized my little ad insert got put in the wrong place, but I can move that later. Anyway, it's from one of my favorite pattern designers, and that is Liz Quirk. She has a new pattern out, a new sock called the Brocket Sock Pattern. Here it is. This was the tweet I saw that made me aware of this particular pattern. And we're going to pop over to the Etsy store so you can get a better look at it. Um, there we go. So this is the Brocket Sock. The, a Brocket is a two-year-old red deer, male red deer. Um, and this lacy knit pattern that is inserted into this sock reminded her of the horns of a brocket. So that's how it got its name. Um, and it's just a lovely sock. This is, this is the kind of sock that I really enjoy, which is it's mostly stockinette really straightforward knitting, but it has just uh, one detail in it. In this case, a lace insert along the side of the sock that gives it just a little bit more interest in knitting than just a vanilla stockinette stock. The heel is a flap and gusset heel. Here, there's a good picture. It's a flap and gusset heel, and it looks like, I think, it's either heel stitch or it's eye of partridge stitch, but uh, you can easily substitute either heel stitch for partridge stitch or vice versa, depending on what your preference is. I personally like the part eye of partridge stitch myself. <laughs> so yeah, really dig it. So it's a really lovely, lovely, lovely sock pattern. And hint... If you want to, I'm, I'm sorry, I gotta do the plug. I'm sorry, guys, I'm sorry. Sorry to insert commercials into all of this, but uh, maybe the nitpick sale, not this week, but the week after, might be an opportunity to stock up on some sock yarn. You might wanna mark that down on your calendar. Just throwing it out there if, you're, if you have an interest in that sort of thing. Let's go throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that is the other new pattern from this week. Wow, I hope I wasn't talking too quickly today because I just looked up and I thought we were going to run long because there was so much I wanted to cover today. And I'm like, wow, I actually did really well on time. I don't know, maybe it's having an outline. <laughs> having an outline really helps. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's everything for today, unless, uh, let's just look through comments. Let's see what comments there are. Let's see, Samantha H, way to tie it all together. Thank you, <laughs> I'm very proud of that. It's nice, uh, I don't know if I've, I'm sure I have mentioned. Uh, when I first moved to LA, one of my first jobs was a, a, being a Universal Studio Guide. So I used to do the tram tour and take people through the Universal back lot. Um, and, a part of training was like thinking of segueing from one topic to the next. Like segues were really important. They constantly connect to one thing. So in the back of my mind, I always have uh, segues going like, how can I segue into this? How can I segue into this? Samantha, also is from Samantha H. Sweet, I finally finished knitting my first pair of basic socks last night. Yay, congratulations. Congratulations. It always feels good when you finish your first pair of socks because 
I think sock knitting is definitely one of those things in knitting that knitters, I was, I was definitely intimidated by sock knitting the first time I approached it. Um, in fact, it was something I took a class on and I, I avoided it for years because I was, I always took the attitude of, well, I don't like wearing socks anyway. So why would I want to knit socks? And, um, I got over it and I learned to knit a sock and I fell in love with sock knitting. Um, speaking of sock knitting, this is my current project. I mean, the current project that I've actually focused on, cause I got a lot of whips around, got a lot of whips around. Uh, but this is it. I thought I would be further. I thought I would actually be at the grafting portion of it by now, but I ripped out my toe, but I am at the toe shaping. Um, I'm at the toe shaping and I actually had a good portion of the toe shaping done. And then last night I was looking at it and I wasn't happy. So I ripped it back and I'm trying again today. I think I have a better plan in my head on the toe shaping. So, but that's where I'm at with it. And, you know, the thing is, it's like once you learn how to knit the basic sock, yes, you can get into some very, like, more interesting construction techniques. And there's all sorts of heels and toes to learn, which is one of the reasons I enjoy sock knitting so much is because there are all these different construction techniques. That being said, once you know how to knit one sock, learning how to knit another sock or doing another pattern, it's real simple because the basic construction is the basic shape of the sock is the same. And it's also something like if you're interested in like kind of coming up with your own ideas, socks are really easy to design for because the basic construction is the same. And you're just picking a different stitch pattern to put into it like this. Like this is just a pattern that I saw in a book. Um, and I was like, I'll just insert this in to some two by two ribbing. And that's I didn't even plan this out. I've been improvising this sock. So yeah, love sock knitting. Love it. And very excited for you, Samantha. So, so excited for you uh, that you've had that, that first experience. And uh, there are lots, lots of exciting, lots of exciting sock patterns out there. Many of them you can find on knitswordsat.com slash fiber happenings. Boom, got another plug in. I'm like a plug machine today. <laughs> um, so yeah, what's coming up in the coming weeks? Okay, so I am going to get a new video up this Friday. I swear, I swear. Uh, I want it to be the movie video, the video of me talking about the knitwear and the movie Misery. I want it to be that video. But we we'll see if it is. It's just taking me a lot longer to edit than I expected. It's taking me longer to edit than I expected because, quite frankly, my paying gig that I'm working on right now is taking up a lot of freaking time, <laughs> which, I mean, it's work, but it's just been a particularly busy time on the show. If you don't know, I work in television, namely I work in reality television. I have been working on a new show for TLC called You, Me, and My Ex. It premieres on June 20th. Uh, and we're up against air dates and trying to deliver episodes. So it's just been very busy time. So I've had a hard time this past, this past week in particular, finding time to edit. So it may be the misery video. It might be this Friday, the video going up might be me trying to do the Finchley graft for the very first time. Um, we'll see. It might be the grafting video because I think I can edit it faster. But I will get the misery video done because I've been talking about it with you guys for so long. And, you know, you guys deserve to see it. <laughs> you guys deserve to see it. Um, so, oh, I mentioned the paying gig and when that premieres. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's everything. Uh, if you want to keep up, uh, of course, on what I am uploading, when I'm going to live stream, the best way to do that, well, first, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, make sure your YouTube notifications are on, and then you get alerted whenever I upload a new video or I schedule a live stream, um, and that way you can always keep up to date. But also, follow me on social media. All my social media is down in the description box. 
also in the description box. You will find all the affiliate links. You will find links to all the products that I talked today um, during the sale. You'll find a link to uh, Germander Cottage Crafts Etsy store. You will find links to the website so you can check out Fiber Happenings and my blog post. Uh, all the links, all the links, all the links are down in the description box. Uh, what else? I think that's, did I hit everything? Oh, also down in the description box. Uh, if you would like to help support my channel, uh, of course, the best way always to help support the channel is totally free, which is subscribing, hitting the notification bell, commenting on the video, always helpful. Uh, but if you would like to help monetarily, you can always buy me a coffee. And uh, on my Buy Me a Coffee page, you can always see what current goal I have, what I'm saving those tips up for. Because I always earmark the tips from Buy Me a Coffee for something, a particular need. All right. And uh, you can always see what my current goal is when you go to the Buy Me a Coffee page. Again, that link is in the description box. And got that, got that, got that. All right, guys, our time has come to an end and I was really efficient today. I'm very like, pat myself on the back, only going a little bit over. Um, if, again, if you're watching on the replay, thank you so much. Please make sure to join the conversation down in the comments. It's never too late to join the conversation. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Uh, I hope you have a great week ahead. Again, if I haven't said it, I think I probably have, but again, 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 thank you so much for joining me. And as always, happy health and happy knitting. Bye.